So, in the uh, last class, we looked at uh, various uh, types of combustors. Basically, there are three types of combustors that are used in uh, aircraft engine application. One is the can combustor, the annular combustor, and then the can annular combustor that, uh, that I am showing here. What we will do today is start with a discussion of the uh, kind of processes that take place in a single can. So, we are going to take a single can and see uh, the thermodynamic processes inside uh, such a can. So, here we are showing the cross sectional view of a can and uh, the air as you can see comes in uh, this way. So, that is through the air scoop fuel is also injected. Now, the uh, amount of air that comes in here can be quite high for a gas turbine engine. Only part of that about uh, 20 to maybe 25, 30 percent of that air is sent through this the primary port and the remaining air is then diverted to other places. So, this is the liner. So, what you see here is the liner and as we saw earlier, the liner has a lot of holes on its circumference. The holes allow the air to enter the combustion chamber this way. As, as these arrows show, uh, air is also entered, admitted into the uh, combustion chamber through these holes. Now, the combustion chamber itself can be roughly divided into three parts. Uh, one is called the primary zone where the uh, combustion takes place. The bulk of the combustion takes place in this zone. There is an intermediate zone where uh, depending upon the altitude and the operation operating condition, some of the combustion reactions may proceed. Okay. So, the intermediate zone is provided to allow for uh, combustion reactions to come to a completion irrespective of the altitude at which we are operating. For example, at uh, sea level, the density of the air is higher. So, the combustions, you know, uh, combustion reactions will proceed faster than for example, at uh, 35,000 feet, where the pressure ratio may be constant, but still the pressure of the air entering the combustor is less now, right. So, the intermediate zone allows for such reactions to go to a completion. The dilution zone is where uh, the extra air is added to reduce the temperature of the the combustion gases when they leave the combustor. Unlike in an IC engine, here the uh, temperature of the combustion gases can be very, very high. As it is, they are very high and we add the air to dilute the combustion products so that they are at uh, the gases or at an acceptable temperature when they enter the uh, high pressure turbine. So, here you see the veins which we saw yesterday. Right? So, if you look at the uh, previous figure, you can see this uh, guide veins before the uh, on the combustor, uh, before the gases enter the uh, turbine and these guide veins are uh, shown here in this cross sectional view. So, if you look at the apportioning of the air, you can see that about 25 to 30 percent normally goes here and uh, about 60 percent goes into the remainder, uh, goes into the intermediate zone and a lot of it goes into the dilution zone. Okay? The bulk of the air goes into the dilution zone, about 5 to 10 percent of the air from the compressor goes for cooling of the turbine blades. Okay? Because this is uh, important to make sure that the high pressure turbine blades and also the first few stages of the intermediate pressure turbine blades do not melt because the operating temperature is well above the melting point of the blade metal. So, the cooling air is essential, but you must also understand that the uh, cooling air does not generate in participation of thrust. So, it must be kept as small as possible. The amount of air that is drawn for cooling should be kept as small as possible without compromising the integrity of the turbine blades. Okay? So, the interesting aspect is for a gas turbine engine, if you look at the mass flow rate of fuel to mass flow rate of air, the ratio could be as high as 1 to 60. However, wherever combustion takes place, the uh, ratio of fuel to air is closer to stoichiometric ratio. Okay? So, that combustion is uh, close to being 100 percent complete. The rest of the air is used for uh, diluting the combustion product, so that the peak temperature, if you remember the adiabatic flame temperature for typical hydrocarbon fuels will be of the range of about 2500 Kelvin or 2600 Kelvin. That is not a temperature at which we can operate these devices yet based on today's technology, which is why we add so much air into this. 60 percent is a lot, you know, if you uh, think about 60 percent, 60 percent of uh, 1000 kg per second is 600 kilogram per second, right. So, that much air is used to dilute the combustion products. So, which brings the temperature of the combustion gases down to about uh, 1500 or 1600 or 1700 Kelvin or so, which is the peak temperature at which these engines operate. 
So, we take it from the maximum possible temperature in these cases is the adiabatic flame temperature which is around 24, 2500 Kelvin. So, we bring it down to about 1700 Kelvin which is where we uh, like to operate in these things. So, if you look at the uh, combustor, the important considerations number one uh, is that the combustor is exposed to the highest possible pressure in the cycle because the air enters the combustor from the high pressure compressor. So, it has the highest pressure possible and also the highest temperature. Okay? But the advantage is it is not a rotating component. So, the stresses in the uh, combustor material or combustor component itself is primarily thermal stress only, exposure to high temperature which brings in metallurgical issues and thermal stress. There are no mechanical stresses other than that in the combustor. So, we must take this into account when selecting materials for the combustor components. Okay? So, we will take that into account. The other important aspect about the combustor is the emissions perspective. Okay? One of the major problem, uh, so we will, uh, we will come back to this in a minute. Uh, let us look at uh, emissions uh, perspective. One of the biggest problem with the aircraft engine is that because we are using so much air, right? we are using 60 to 1, right? we are using so much air, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a tendency for these engines to produce a lot of NOx. Remember, the air even when it leaves the nozzle exhaust can usually be at high temperatures. Okay? So, there is continuous formation of NOx in these engines and remember these engines are operating at altitudes of 35,000 feet or more. So, they are releasing the NOx directly into the upper levels of the atmosphere, okay, which is a very bad thing for this, uh, you know, uh, from, an, from an emission perspective. So, the push is to reduce the amount of NOx and CO2 that these engines emit. Usually, uh, unburnt hydrocarbons and other things from these engines are very small because the combustion temperature is so high that you will not get unburnt hydrocarbons and so on, but CO2 production is quite high and NOx production is also quite high. So, here we are looking at trends in uh, three different aspects from a combustor perspective, amount of CO2 uh, over the years, turbine entry temperatures over the years and pressure ratio over the years. So, you can see that uh, the pressure ratio has consistently gone up to a value now where it is operating at about 40 or so. Most modern aircraft engines operate at pressure ratios around 40. Okay, so, this gives the thermodynamic efficiency of the uh, gas turbine engine is directly dependent upon the peak temperature and the pressure ratio. Peak temperature also you can see that uh, starting from uh, 1100 in about 1965, it has now gone up to 1500 degree Celsius or so and this is about 1700-1800 Kelvin, close to 1800 Kelvin. Okay. So, you can see the increase in trend over the years. The pressure ratio trend is more or less asymptotic. Okay, it is about 40 appears to be the, uh, the value for these engines. There is no push to increase the pressure ratio beyond that. So, that means the scope for improvement in compressor and turbines is to reduce the weight, not to increase the pressure ratio, but for the same pressure ratio can we reduce the weight. So, that is where the push is in the technology in the design of these components, compressor and turbines and also fans. Okay. Now, turbine entry temperature, however, there is a continuous increase in the turbine entry temperature up to this day. It is now, it has stabilized at about 1500 degree Celsius or so, only now. So, this uh, shows only up to 2000. Between 2000 and today, you will probably uh, see that this trend is kind of flattened out. About 1500 to 1600 is where it is today. Okay? But CO2 levels have gone down uh, primarily because the fuel efficiency of the devices have increased and combustors have also become better. But since the combustion temperatures have always been high, okay, um, CO2 uh, production as I said you know, will also be quite high because you know, combustion process is complete. But one danger with uh, such high temperature is that when you produce so much CO2 at such high temperatures, there is also possibility for the CO2 to become CO. So, we have to be very careful about the conversion of CO2 back to CO due to dissociation, we need to keep that in mind. But fortunately, the gases stay in the combustor only for a certain short period of time as they move through. So, this kind of danger may be minimal, but the formation of NOx is actually a much more serious problem. CO2 of course, is also a serious problem. So, if you look at uh, what has been done over the years, you know, uh, compared to earlier years, we can see that unburnt hydrocarbon has now come down to almost 
negligible level because the combustion process is complete in almost all the modern combustors. Uh, CO has come down considerably, NOx has not come down considerably because you know the air fuel ratios more or less remain the same. The more efficient the combustion process you know the uh, NOx formation is also going to increase because the temperatures are continuously being increased. So, the, uh, the tendency in uh, today's technology or today's um, uh, environment is to see how we can minimize this. One uh, attribute or one uh, way by which this can be reduced is to use uh, biodiesel and other biological alternatives which tend to produce less NOx. Okay? But um, getting good combustion efficiencies in uh, when using such fuels continues to be a challenge, but it is possible to do that and many uh, airline companies are now looking at synthetic fuels which are tailored so that emissions can be minimized. Okay? So, that is being pursued. We will look at that when we uh, talk about where the industry is going today and uh, towards the end we will discuss that. So, as I said earlier, uh, if you look at emission versus combustion temperature, okay, you can see that you get a lot of CO and the combustion is incomplete. So, the amount of CO goes down as the combustion becomes better and better. So, when you have stoichiometric combustion for example, the amount of CO is minimum almost 0. But if you continue to increase the temperature beyond this, if you continue to increase the uh, combustion temperature beyond this, then the CO2 will begin to dissociate into CO. So, we need to bear that in mind that is what this curve shows beyond a certain temperature you have dissociation taking place. So, the point where the CO is a, is a minimum is where we want to operate that is close to being stoichiometric combustion. But notice that the NOx will continue to increase with combustion temperature. Okay, so, a compromise so we cannot avoid the formation of NOx, but a compromise has to be made so that you have as low value of NOx as possible and keeping CO to be the lowest possible value. So, aircraft engines typically tend to operate in this range. Although from an efficiency perspective it may be more suitable to shift this to the right, but from an emissions perspective it is not better to shift this to the right. Okay, so, those, these are the conflicting considerations that we must work with or you may you need to figure out how to increase the combustion temperature while keeping the emissions also at a lower level. That is very challenging and very difficult to do, but that is also a technology uh, front that is being pursued today. One of the uh, strategies that is being tried for uh, reducing emission has to uh, do with this uh, so called fuel staging. So, normally when you ha allow or admit fuel into the combustor at only one location. Now, as the engine goes from full load at takeoff thrust to part load when it is cruising, right, uh, it is not optimized for emissions perspective. See, emissions is uh, you can optimize for one operating condition, but for not for all operating conditions. So, under takeoff or high thrust settings, you tend to use much more fuel and when you are cruising, you tend to use much less fuel. The same combustor cannot operate such widely varying operate, I mean cannot accommodate such widely varying operating conditions while still uh, keeping the emissions to a minimum. So, what is done these days is to use something called a staged fuel injection. So, the stage at the top is always on, fuel is always admitted from here and then depending upon the requirement, if you want more thrust then one more stage comes on. If you want even more thrust then other stages come on and as the thrust requirement goes down these stages are slowly turned off. So, that way you are optimizing the emissions in accordance with the operating condition. There is an extremely effective strategy and it also has very good flame stability. Plus, you produce the minimum possible NOx and CO for the entire range of operating conditions. Okay? Whereas, here you really do not have a control over the amount of oxygen or CO under high fuel injection conditions. When you are injecting a lot of fuel and if the combustion efficiency is not the same, which it will not be, then you tend to produce a lot of CO because combustion is not complete. As the amount of fuel reduces, the amount of CO will also go down. <coughs> But here, because we are using staged injection, the amount of fuel in the combustion chamber is always such that it is commensurate with the load and 
the combustion efficiency also remains fairly high under all ranges of operating condition. So, this is the strategy that is being pursued today to minimize the emissions while not compromising the performance or stability. <coughs> Before we go to the next component turbine, let us just take a look at the uh, materials that we are going to use in the combustors. Uh, as I said, you know the primary uh, stress in the liner is thermal gradients, high temperature, it is exposed to high temperatures and of course also transient stresses as we said due to the duty cycle. You know you, you take it up, you have a takeoff maximum thrust setting, cruise and then again you are coming down and then cooling down. So, this causes lot of uh, stress on the uh, combustor liners and so thermal stress is a major problem. Exposure to high temperature also causes oxidation of the metal which is also a problem. <coughs> Good news, it is a non-rotating component which means there are no centrifugal stresses. So, we are uh, not worried on that front. So, currently both the liners and the other parts of the combustors are made out of nickel based alloys, nickel and chromium based alloys which can withstand the high temperatures and resist oxidation. Uh, but there is a push in the industry now to coat all the liners and other things with ceramics. Okay, the ceramics give good high temperature protection and the nickel based alloys underneath give good uh, protection to transient stresses. Okay, so, that is where we are going today ceramic composites or the so called thermal barrier coating TBC is a very promising technology which allows the which hopefully should allow us to see a jump in the operating temperature of these engines. Okay. Okay, so, we now move on to the next component in the engine we have seen the inlet, we have seen compressors, we have seen combustors, now we are going to turbines. Notice that the terminology uh, differs depending on which country you are in. Uh, Britishers call this component inlet, whereas Americans call this intake. Britishers call this a combustor, whereas Americans tend to call this a burner. Okay, but both mean the same thing, intake and inlet are the same. Okay. So, here we are looking at uh, cross sectional view of a multi stage turbine and just as we said before, uh, we have a rotor blade which is rotating stator blades which redirect the flow onto the next set of rotor blades same as before. The biggest difference being now the uh, pressure decreases as the fluid flows through the turbine from left to right here okay? because uh, the fluid undergoes an expansion process the pressure decreases. So, there is no danger of an adverse pressure gradient or flow separation because of that, which means that each turbine stage can probably do far more work than a single compressor stage. In the single uh, compressor stage we were limited to pressure ratios of 1.15. Consequently, the blade loading coefficient and the amount of work that I can put into a compressor blade was also very small. Here, the amount of work that I can get out of a single stage of a turbine blade can be quite high which means that the number of turbine blades in a typical aircraft engine will be considerably less than the number of blades in a compressor stage. And you can also see why. So, this is the cross sectional view of an actual turbine blade. And you can see immediately it must strike you that the blades are much thicker. And also notice the uh, angle of turning, the flow turning that is accomplished in these blade passages. This is much higher than before. And the velocity vector, the combined velocity, this is the inlet velocity vector, okay, this is the outlet velocity vector and you see the combined velocity vector. You can see that as far as the uh, relative velocity component is concerned, you can see the cross sectional area decreasing as the fluid flows through this, right. So, you can see the increase in C1, the relative velocity from inlet to outlet. Previously, this were almost the same because we wanted to keep the diffusion process to be free from flow separation. But now we can see the tremendous increase in C1 to C2 and the consequent increase in delta V. Remember the amount of energy transfer is proportional to delta V, right. So, the velocity change is huge which means I am extracting large amounts of work from the turbine. Also notice that delta V vector is in this direction blade velocity is in the opposite direction. So, this should tell you that this is a turbine and not a compressor. 
ok. So, because the blade loading coefficient can be so high, we can extract a lot of work from the turbine blades across all stages of the turbine blades. Okay. So, the number of turbine blades can be much less than the number of compressor blades for most of these uh, engines and so as we said earlier the efficiency depends directly on the pressure ratio and the maximum temperature that is what the efficiency depends on and increased maximum pressures have been achieved through improved compressor aerodynamics. Even if you improve the pressure ratio of a single stage of a compressor from 1.15 to let us say 1.2, the number of stages can be reduced approximately by about 5. Redu reduction in 5 stages as I said will uh, work out to a reduction in the number of blades by about 700 or so, that is a considerable reduction in the weight. Right. So, small improvements in efficiency alone are possible these days. So, we are talking about improving ratios from 1.15 to maybe 1.17, okay. which is why that uh, pressure ratio curve is more or less asymptoted. We are operating now at the best possible pressure ratio. So, the technology is more or less saturated in this. Further gains have to be made only by materials, maybe improved aerodynamics, but not with the view to increasing the pressure ratio, but making each stage do more with less okay. and increased maximum temperatures in the combustor and turbine have been achieved through better cooling and materials. Now, if you think about the components in, uh, in the uh, aircraft engine, let us just uh, look at this. If you look at the various components, right? we have inlet, we have a fan, uh, we have a compressor, we have a combustor, a high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine and then the nozzle. Okay. Let me just uh, quickly go back to one of the uh, earlier slides that I had and uh, let us take a quick look. So, if you look at this, uh, this diagram and right, here it shows the pressure, temperature and velocity variation across the engine. Judging from this diagram, which component will you say is the most critical component in this engine? So, we have fan, the uh, low pressure compressor, intermediate high pressure compressor, combustor, uh, high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine and nozzle, which is the most stressed component. High, uh, high pressure turbine. The high pressure turbine is the most stressed because it is the one component which sees the highest pressure, highest temperature and highest RPM. Okay, the combustor sees the highest pressure and highest temperature, but it does not rotate. The fan also has challenges. The fan is equally challenging, if not more challenging than the high pressure turbine, but the high pressure turbine sees the highest pressure as you can see, the highest temperature and the highest rotation speed. Here we are showing only the axial velocity, but if you look at RPM, the high pressure turbine typically spins at 10,000 RPM. So, it also sees a very high centrifugal stresses, not the highest centrifugal stress, but very high centrifugal stresses. The highest centrifugal stress is seen by the fan and we will look at that next, okay. Let me see. So, that means we need to protect really give special protection to the high pressure turbine blades. The blades have to be manufactured very carefully. So, the turbine blades, the high pressure turbine blades are subject, subjected to very high speeds, temperatures and pressure. The centrifugal load on a typical high pressure turbine blade is usually of the order of few tens of tons. Okay. So, the stresses are very high which means that what we need to do is we need to have a multi prong strategy, usually a two prong strategy or a three prong strategy to make sure that the turbine blades can operate in this environment without breaking down, without failing. Okay. So, what is, uh, uh, what is done is this, of course, we need to keep in mind that the temperature of the gases when it enters the high pressure turbine stage is about 400 degrees Celsius above the melting point of the blade metal. Okay. For the blades to continue to operate in such an environment, we do two things. Number one, we cool the blades and number two, we make sure that 
we fabricate them with good materials to resist other metallurgical problems. They must also continue to operate. We cannot change the blades once every week or once every fortnight or once every month. Each one of this uh, special turbine blade costs about $50,000 per blade, per blade, okay. And the typical high pressure turbine stage will have about 100 blades or so, uh, that is a lot of money, okay. So, we need to make sure that they can operate as, uh, as long a period as possible, okay. But we also should bear in mind that these are the most critical components of this. So, what is, uh, how do we do this? As I said, we do blade cooling. Blade cooling, what is done is, we take the air from the high pressure compressor and we use that for cooling the high pressure turbine vanes. We also cool the blades and discs and the combustor liners are also cooled in the same way. We have film cooling for the combustor liners also to make sure that the hot gas does not come in direct contact with the liner material. Okay, because the liner is also exposed to very high temperatures. So, we have, a, we have a film of cool air around the liners to make sure that the hot air does not come in contact with this. And remember, the liner itself ensures that the hot combustion gases do not come in direct contact with the, the, the air casing. So, the, the liner separates the uh, casing from the gases and we need a film of cool air around the liner to make sure that the hot gases do not come in direct contact with the liner. Okay. So, coolant air is used for this, but remember the air at the end of the HP compressor itself is at 800 degrees Celsius, but that is cool compared to 1700 or the gases are at temperatures around 2400 or maybe even less. So, they are cooled down to these values once you mix with the uh, cool air in the combustion chamber and then you provide this film cooling, okay. The LP or IP turbine does not require cooling because uh, as we said, the blade loading factor in a turbine is very high. So, the fall of temperature is also very high across the high pressure turbine blade, which means that, you know, these blades can operate without cooling. It is only the high pressure turbine blades which require special cooling. How is this done? So, here is a cross sectional view of a HPT uh, rotor blade from the GE engine, GF6 engine. So, you can see many different things being done. So, the air enters from the bottom, there are passages for the air to enter. So, you see holes on the surface of the blade from which air comes out. So, the blade itself is very hollow as you can see here. So, the air enters like this through these hollow passages and then you can see that the air goes through a very circuitous passage to provide maximum amount of cooling across the entire section of the blade. So, the air comes out like this, goes back in, comes out like this, goes back in. So, it goes through a circuitous passage to cool the entire height of the turbine blade and also entire length of the turbine blade, okay. And then it leaves through holes at the uh, trailing edge, also uh, through holes from the leading edge of the turbine blade. So, this air when it goes out through the uh, through these holes, it flows along the blade surface and forms a protective film or barrier. So, the air itself may be at a temperature, this air film will be at a temperature of about 800, but outside of that the gas is at a temperature of about 1500 to 1600 degree Celsius. So, the air actually acts as an insulator between these two and keeps the film cool, it continuously carries the heat away. It is not stationary, the air is removed continuously, the heat is removed continuously so that the blades do not heat up and start melting, okay. Of course, this cooling technology has improved tremendously over the years. What I showed was one of the earlier uh, generation blades, okay. Notice that there is no cooling of the leading edge. The, as I will show next, if you look at the, uh, if you look at that blade and look at the variation of temperature. You see that the highest temperatures are seen near the uh, front leading edge, I am sorry, near the leading edge and the trailing edge. The leading edge is a stagnation point, which is why the temperatures there and the heat transfer coefficients are very, very high. So, it gets heated up a lot. The trailing edge get heated up a lot because there is simply not enough metal near the trailing edge, okay. The amount of metal that is present there is the smallest possible, so it gets heated up quite a bit. So, we need to provide, take care of special, uh, I mean we need to provide special methods for cooling the leading edge of the turbine. In the newer uh, versions of this uh, turbine blades, you can see something called impingement cooling. So, the air that comes through here is uh, made to impinge directly upon the, the leading edge of the blade. Remember, stagnation flow gives you the highest amount of heat transfer. 
So the impingement cooling does exactly that. So the blade, if the blade surface is curved like this, the cooling air hits the uh, blade surface directly. So you have stagnation heat transfer here and as much of the heat is removed as possible. So the, we take care of the, uh, the leading edge by having impingement cooling. So impingement cooling is a very important technology. Okay. Then you also notice that in these cases, we have given lot of uh, additional uh, small obstructions or uh, protrusions like this, which promote the flow to become turbulent. And turbulent heat transfer as you know is higher than, much higher than laminar heat transfer. So these things promote turbulence and create a lot of, uh, increase the amount of heat transfer that is possible. So you can see that in this design the air, the high pressure air enters this way and then flows upwards through the blades and then comes out through the holes like this. And again, these protrusions are provided near the outer surface so that the heat transfer can be very high near the trailing edge also. Okay. So it is this uh, film of cool air around the turbine blade which prevents the blade from melting. We do other things to make sure that it can continue to operate at these uh, temperatures and pressure, but that is a different thing. The film cooling is what prevents the blade from melting. Okay. But remember, even if it prevents it from melting, that blade temperature is still quite high. As you can see from here, the uh, temperature of the blade in terms of degree Celsius, which is given on the outside here, is as high as about 1100 degree Celsius. That is still very high. So, there are going to be metallurgical issues related to continuous operation at such high temperatures, pressures and RPMs. So we need to worry about that also and that is what we are going to see next. So you can see how the technology has evolved in terms of blade cooling. So uncooled turbine blades can operate only here because the allowable metal temperature itself is only around 1200 Kelvin. Okay. So you can see with the introduction of blade cooling there is a big jump in the temperature. And then simple cooling, sophisticated cooling, film cooling, convection cooling keeps increasing. Now we are using transpiration cooling, some engine manufacturers are doing that and where this will go, we do not know, but, but this is where it is going. Okay? So you can see now that we are operating at temperatures, this is about 2200 Kelvin, allowable. this will allow us to operate at 2200 Kelvin. This is where we are today. We are operating at about these kinds of temperatures. 1800 Kelvin is where we are. So that is about 400 to 500 more than the allowable melting point of the blade metal. So next time you fly in an aircraft, you must remember this. Not feel nervous. It works fine, no problem. So we talked about continuous operation at such high pressures, temperatures and RPM. So that brings in certain metallurgical issues into consideration which is what we have to uh, look at next. First and foremost is creep. Now when you look at creep and fatigue, the uh, blade uh, metal can fail due to these two effects, creep and fatigue. But the interesting part is the load that is applied in creep or fatigue is not more than or higher than the yield point of the blade metal. See, normally all metals will have an yield point. Okay? So they will fail if you apply a load which is higher than the yield point of the blade metal. But what is interesting is in both creep and fatigue, the load is never above the yield point. It is not even close to the yield point. But they can still fail because of the nature of the loading. It is not direct tension or compression loading. but Loading at elevated temperatures or cyclical loading can lead to this kind of failure. For example, the stretching of the blades due to prolonged application of moderate loads at elevated temperature, not loads above yield point, but moderate loads at elevated temperatures. Creep, the, probably the most common example of creep is what happens to uh, pressure cooker gaskets. Have you seen the rubber pressure cooker gaskets? When you buy them, they are very stiff. But you continue to use them after about uh, 2 or 3 months of usage, you can see that the, the rubber has creeped. It can no longer be used, it is no longer stiff, it no longer acts as a seal. It cannot seal the, the steam from escaping, that is creep. But the, the rubber gasket has not been broken, it has just creeped. Right? So that is the difference between moderate load at elevated temperatures and yield point load. 
okay. So that is also dangerous and these uh, turbine blade materials are exposed to loads at elevated temperatures. That is why we have to be worried about them. Fatigue happens due to cyclical loading and cyclical loading comes because as I said the duty cycle itself is like that, right. So when it is an idle uh, that is when the uh, engine is the at the best possible situation. Take off means take off thrust maximum, it is stressed the maximum during take off, okay. And then climb again moderate levels of thrust, cruise minimum level of thrust right next to idle in terms of desirability. Okay. And then reverse thrust, climbing down reverse thrust and then idle again gives you a cycle. So, it is all cycled through this way and the components are exposed to these kinds of fatigue. And if you think about uh, fatigue, the best possible real life example is how you break a paper clip. And if you take a paper clip and if you constantly do this way that way, you can break it very easily, correct. The same paper clip, if I try to pull it apart, will I be able to do it? I cannot do it. So, if I pull it apart, that is when I am applying the a load which is more than the yield point of the metal. But when I do this way that way, I am able to break it very easily because I am fatiguing the metal and then breaking it, okay. So that is the difference between breaking something apart and then fatiguing it to failure. So fatigue failure and creep failure arise, they are dangerous because they arise even when the loads are nowhere close to being the, the yield point of the metal. That is why they are very dangerous and we have to be uh, aware of that. Creep as I said comes because we are exposing it to elevated temperature, fatigue is due to cyclical load. The other danger is oxidation, corrosion and oxidation. Corrosion comes mainly because of oxidation of the turbine metal when it is elevated to high temperatures. As you know, metals at high temperatures are very prone to oxidation. Oxygen will uh, has a great affinity or metal has a great affinity to oxygen at elevated temperatures. Okay. In fact, if hot metal is exposed to water, then the oxygen in the water will preferentially oxidize the metal leaving the hydrogen behind. And if it is in a confined space, the hydrogen can cause an explosion. Where did this happen? Fukushima, that is what caused the Fukushima accident. The hot metal took away the oxygen from the cooling water and then it created a uh, cloud of hydrogen gas inside the reactor which then exploded. So oxidation is a serious problem with uh, exposure to metals of uh, metals exposed to high temperatures and usually these are made out of nickel based alloys with chromium and cobalt added to them because chromium and cobalt both provide oxidation, very good oxidation resistance at elevated temperatures. These are the metallurgical issues, there are also other things that we can do. If you take a close look at uh, how failure starts in a turbine blade, a failure or a crack, if you look at a normal, normally cast turbine blade, okay, the normal casting will produce lot of grain boundaries. There will be lot of grains and lot of grain boundaries. The grain boundary is where the metal is the weakest. So when you apply a load, remember these are blades which are spinning this way. So the load is acting in this direction, Centrif the uh, centrifugal load is a tensile load which acts in this direction. So any grain boundary which is oriented normal to the stress axis, remember the stress axis is like this. So any grain boundary which is oriented normal to the stress axis is pulled apart and that is where the crack is initiated and then the crack propagates. One way out of this dilemma uh, that uh, aircraft engine manufacturers have done is to cast the uh, metal in such a way that all the grain boundaries are parallel to the stress axis. So if they are perpendicular to the stress axis, they will be pulled apart. So uh, cast all of them parallel to the grain axis, uh, parallel to the stress axis. Then they have much higher strength and that is what is called directional solidification process. That is what you see here. All the grain boundaries are parallel to the stress axis. That is called directional solidification. Probably the best thing would be not have any grain boundaries at all. That is to use something called a single crystal. Most modern high pressure turbine blades, rotor blades are made with single crystals today. There are no grain boundaries which is why they cost $50,000 a pop, okay. That plus the exotic cooling, this and other things. What are the other things that we are talking about? So you can see the, uh, the uh, trend in the technology with years in terms of blade materials, okay. 
So, this is blade material and increase in temperature over the years. This is not talking about cooling, just blade material versus possible turbine temperatures. So, you can see that conventionally cast, then we went to directionally solidified, now we are operating with single crystal. Okay? This is without cooling. So, cooling will add another 300, 400 degree Celsius to the operating margin. Right? And then if you go to ceramics, you can go to even higher temperatures. So, here you are looking at a turbine blade, high pressure uh, turbine blade coated with ceramic, which is called a thermal barrier coating. So, this has a thin coating of ceramic on the outside as you can see from here, which allows a further margin of about 70 to 100 degree Celsius. This is called TBC, but there are a lot of issues involved with uh, using ceramics in these types of situations. But remember, it is only a coating, so it is not exposed to any loads, you know. So, this is a very safe uh, way to use ceramics in, for these kinds of applications, okay. So, this is the latest and probably the uh, greatest available in the engine industry today. Uh, fully cooled turbine blade made out of single crystal with ceramic thermal barrier coating. That is the state of the art today. So, we have already uh, discussed uh, these requirements as we said. Uh, the discs are made out of nickel based alloys. They are not specially cooled, but anyway the discs are hollow. So, cooling air can be sent there. That is not an issue. The blades require single crystal. I mean they are made out of single crystal nickel based alloy with TBC and with special cooling. The next component that we will look at is nozzle and the purpose of the nozzle in uh, these devices, that is the last component in the engine. The purpose of the nozzle in an engine is to do two things. One is to provide thrust for propulsion. Next, it is also supposed to give reverse thrust for braking and deceleration. Because without reverse thrust, the runways, the runway requirement would be about 3 to 4 times what it is today. Today, if you thought the runways were long, without that reverse thrust, they have to be 3 to 4 times longer. Because it will take that kind of distance to bring the plane to a complete halt. So, reverse thrust is very essential for braking and bringing the aircraft to a halt. Okay. So, these are the two things that uh, the uh, nozzle must provide. We are talking about uh, commercial aircraft engines, not fighter aircraft where other means are used for braking the aircraft, not this, but other means. Okay. They may use parachutes or they may use arresting cables, arresting wires and so on for bringing the aircraft to a halt. They normally will not have reverse thrust in those types of high performance nozzles. Here we are talking about nozzles used in commercial aviation application. Okay. Now, simplest possible uh, means of reverse thrusting uh, 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 an aircraft is shown here. So, you have this uh, type of thrust reverser which is called a <coughs> clam shell reverser, clam shell, C L A M. So, under normal operation, the uh, clams are like this and the air simply goes through without any difficulty produces thrust. But when you want the thrust to be reversed, you bring the clams over this way and the air is then halted and then taken to the other sides. As you can see from the arrow here, the clam shells, the clam shells are open here, then they close and they redirect the air this way producing the reverse thrust. Okay? So, here we actually see a clam thrust reversal in operation. So, you can see these two clamps. So, normally when it is not used through the central mechanism, these two things will be like this and the air will go through. When you want reverse thrust, you bring them forward like this and the air then goes out through them. So, you can see the clamp thrust reverser being used in a turbojet engine here. It is a very rare picture, very difficult to get because you do not see so many turbojet engine today. So, I had to scour the net for this uh, picture, it is very rare to see. Interestingly enough, I have actually seen this in operation when I flew many years ago but I could not find a picture of it. This is a very nice picture. Okay? Modern turbofan engines do not do this. They use a slightly different means for thrust reversing an engine and we will see that when we talk about turbofan engines. This type of uh, clamshell reversers can be used only on turbojet engines which have a single nozzle. So, we can do this to a single nozzle uh, propulsion device, not to a dual nozzle propulsion device. So, turbofan engines try to do something different. 
So, designing of a nozzle uh, for operation at this temperature, again we must be concerned about high temperature, the temperatures can be quite high in these types of situations. Once again, uh, it is not a rotating component, so the stresses are primarily thermal stresses. So, uh, nickel based alloys, even titanium alloys can be used. Remember, the high pressure stages of a compressor is exposed to similar kinds of temperatures which means it is safe to use titanium in these types of situations. Ceramic matrix composites can also be used for this because there are no stresses. The only stress is thermal stress, so ceramics can operate quite well under these circumstances. Okay? So, we will take a look at afterburner nozzle in the next class and then move on to turbofan engines. Okay?